All right, hello, and thanks for tuning in to this edition of the EV Revolution Show. And as you can see, it's another car review show. I'm your host, Kenneth Bocor, by the way. Thanks very much for taking the time out of your busy schedule to watch this show. I've got a brand new 2022, I think it is, or are they calling it 2023? I forget now, but it's a brand new Kia EV6, one of the first ones here in Canada, as Kia has started Canadian deliveries and of course rolling them out throughout North America. They've been in Europe for several months already with some great reviews, so finally got my hands on one. I want to thank Kia Canada very much for allowing me the use of this press vehicle that I've been able to spend a few days with. Beautiful vehicle, love it a lot, so let me get right into telling you my thoughts about it. Now, one of the first things you'll see about the EV6, obviously, is its striking appearance because Kia has this new design language that they've incorporated into the vehicles. They call it movement that inspires. And, you know, looking at this sculpted uh, layout and design of the EV6, it really does inspire you. It gets that sense of that it's moving when it's not even moving. It's a beautiful design language. Um, lots of different neat little things in this. It's kind of, you love it or you hate it, but a very futuristic looking yet it is still extremely practical from an electric vehicle perspective. Now, of course, this is part of the company's new brand and Plan S strategy, as they call it, um, and this is their first dedicated battery all-electric vehicle. Of course, this is based on the eGMP platform that is uh, produced by HMC, Hyundai Motor Corporation, which owns Kia, Hyundai, and Genesis, of course, those three brands. So those three brands share that platform, and this is the first to come out under the Kia nameplate that is utilizing that platform. And I can tell you folks, just in the few days that I've been driving it, it's an excellent platform, lots of stability, and of course, when you have that skateboard design, you're able to do a lot of different interior elements and design elements to incorporate all the space that you get because you don't have that big engine bay, and you can move things forward and move things down, make it flatter floors really enhances the space, and Kia's done a great job of doing that in the EV6. So Kia mentions that its design has a lot of striking features, things that are eye-catching, and when you look at the front of this vehicle, um, it certainly is eye-catching with these nice triangular uh, shaped headlights, uh, LED headlights, of course, package on here. Um, really a nice front bumper ailment. You've got your front forward ra uh, radar here, of course, and a lot of sensors that are around the vehicle. Um, it is a nice look. I've had actually a few people that have turned their heads and say, hey, what car is that? Kia, like, tell me a little bit more about it. So people are very interested in looking at the design. Again, inspired by that kind of electronic pixel, and obviously the Ionic 5 has a lot more of that going on, but they've gone with that design language. And really a sharp, ranked, uh, raked clamshell hood design. So again, it very, to try to minimize aerodynamics and efficiencies, of course. Um, and just a lot of really nice features, you know, auto flush, uh, door handles, of course, which is everybody's kind of pretty well doing them for EVs nowadays, and full LED package all the way around, which is pretty nice. Again, that design carries to the rear, and this is where it really differentiates itself from a lot of the competition out there. Got this striking rear element here, uh, LED element that goes across. You've got your turn signals built in, and then this is a lighted LED bar at night when your lights are on uh, with a high kind of trunk lift on that, or at least it looks like that. Uh, you know, it took me a little while to kind of get used to this one. I wasn't so sure. But when you see it in person and then, you know, experience it, it's actually very, very nice, uh, nice design. So futuristic technology looking design, yet, you know, very versatile and practical. Now, while I'm here looking at the back of this, I do want to point out that we're seeing this trend continue on a lot of models with hatchbacks that aren't putting, the OEMs are not putting rear wipers on these things like the Ionic 5 and the Cadillac Lyric, a couple of that I pointed out already. Seems to be a trend. Their thought is that as you can see, you've got this sculpted spoiler up here that has uh, openings in it to direct the wind down underneath the spoiler onto the glass and then off. While you're moving, the functionality of that is to move the water and the debris off of the rear windshield so that you can still have a clear rear uh, glass element here. Um, that's the theory. Does it work in practice? Well, I have a little bit of a, when I show you my driving stuff coming up in a bit, I'll talk a little bit more about that because the second day I had this, it was a nice big snowstorm here. So I got some good, good chance to experience some bad weather in this vehicle, which handled quite well. So, but that seems to be a trend. 
So yeah, the, the potential problem with that is as you have the, the wind vortexes that come off the back of the car, the wind circulates and you get debris and, and stuff that comes back under that rear glass. This is a high lift, so it may not be that challenging, that, that uh, much of an impact, but we'll have to wait and see and, and you know, look at owner reports. I don't think it's a game changer or a showstopper in any way, um, but I do think it's something that owners, especially in harsher climates that have a lot of that need to think about um, in, in these type of applications. Um, I'm not sure why they're moving away, to be honest with you, from rear wipers, whether it's a cost element or do they just see there's none needed because of the way of the design, but we'll have to wait and see. Now, before I show you the inside, you know, the main interest for an electric vehicle is the powertrain, of course. And as I mentioned earlier, this is based on the global platform from HMC. So the battery pack comes in two elements, either a 58 kilowatt hour version or a 77.4 kilowatt hour version. And I'll get the pricing and trim packages at the end. So you've got a good selection of either a single motor rear wheel drive configuration with both batteries, or you can do a dual motor all wheel drive configuration with the larger batteries. Then there is a top spec, a GT version that has more powerful motors, draws more power. So that will, you know, uh, get you from zero to 60 and I think around uh, three and a half seconds or so, it's a pretty powerful beast. Do you need all that power? No, but it's there for the folks who like it. So as I mentioned, that platform comes in two battery sizes, 58 kilowatt and 770.4. Now, here are all the different trim options that are available in Canada. You can get a rear wheel drive option, single motor with the 58 kilowatt hour battery. Gives you 167 horsepower, 258 pound feet of torque with a range of 373 kilometers or about 232 miles, zero to 60 in about seven seconds, which is a little bit uh, kind of like a Nissan Leaf. Uh, just a little bit faster, so not bad at all. You can get the rear-wheel drive in a larger battery variant. So again, single motor, rear-wheel drive with the 77.4 kilowatt battery. That will give you 226 horsepower or 258 pound-feet of torque, uh, granting you uh, their longest range uh, in this uh, model line of 499 kilometers or 310 miles, and it pushes that zero to 60 time up or faster to 4.6 seconds, so quite a significant jump there. Then if you want all-wheel drive you can, and with a larger battery, that's your next option. So you can get that with the 77.4 kilowatt hour battery. Comes in a dual motor combined output of 320 horsepower and 446 pound-feet of torque. Uh, and that comes in two trim packages, a long range GT uh, uh, level one or line one and GT line two. They're all both all wheel drives with those specs, um, but with uh, up to 441 kilometers of range or 4, 274 miles on that zero to 60 in four and a half seconds again. So quite adequate. And if you had a lot of money to blow and you wanted to go for the top spec performance GT all wheel drive, then you can get that through this model line again with the 77.4 kilowatt hour battery with a dual motor combined output of 576 horsepower and 546 pound feet of torque, which in the GT model will get you a zero to 60 in three and a half seconds. And that's pretty fast. Now one benefit of course of Hyundai Motor Corp's uh, eGMP platform is the 800 volt architecture gets very fast charging, uh, which is a really big bonus for these, uh, these brands. You know, they state uh, getting 10 to 80% in about 18 minutes if you're at an HPC. I'll put up this uh, uh, charging curve that you can see how it uh, pulls the power for a good amount of time uh, to give you that fast charge. Now for the Canadian market, this will come with a heat pump, which is great news. Uh, I believe it may come for some of the uh, other markets in the world, the global markets that are our northern uh, climate uh, countries, uh, northern region countries. So you have to check your local uh, Hyundai, uh, or sorry, excuse me, Kia dealer for that information or website. Uh, the charging port is here in the back uh, passenger quarter. Just push that and it should open. There we go opens to see your standard J1772. Fold down this flap for your CCS combo element or pull it out, I guess. I should have probably tried this, eh, first? But that's the way I roll, guys. I just try it with you. So yeah, so then you have your DC fast charging connectors for your CCS. Um, and again, you know, this will pull over 200 kilowatts on the initial charge, depending on the on the state of charge of that battery. So it's really good from a charging capacity. Shows you your current battery levels and just push that button and it closes up. 
Now this also has vehicle to load capabilities and if you're not familiar with that, that means that you can plug something into this vehicle and get power from it. So it's not just one directional uh, charging where you can only put power into it through the use of a plug that's in the back seat on the floor, a 110, 120 plug or through an adapter and I'll show you some uh, a quick video on that coming up on how that works. Um, you can actually pull power from it and use it for stuff. So inherently in their vehicles they have a plug and I'll show you a picture here in the rear part of the, um, the floor uh, behind the, the center console, a 110, 120 plug that you can plug something into, a computer, a laptop, some lights if you're camping, some light appliances, things like that. Uh, but also, uh, if you spend the money now, I believe on the Genesis models, when I get to those, they're going to come with it. But uh, and some of the higher end spec, both the Ionic 5s and here in the EV6, because this is a higher end spec, come with the adapter, whatever, vehicle to load adapter it's called. And you've seen pictures of it. It plugs, uh, has an end that plugs into the J1772 port here. As soon as I can unlock it. And then at the other end, this uh, closes down and you have a 110 plug. Hopefully you can see that okay there. Uh, so let's see if it works. All right, so I've opened the charge port and I just take the adapter, plug it in basically. Don't know if the car needs to be on. I uh, don't know if, and I have a lock and I have a green light showing on here, which means I should be able to use this kettle. Put a little water in here, plug it in and let's hope I don't blow anything else out. But you know, that's the beauty of trying something for the first time. And yeah, the kettle light is on. I have to look at this because it's bright outside and it shall boil some water for me to make a cup of tea. Now, one thing about this style of uh, compact SUV, because that's really the class that this is in, everybody seems to be throwing CUV around like there's no tomorrow, is space, is storage space. It's okay, you know, you're not going to get um, a full-size uh, SUV type of cargo space on this, it's okay. With the second floor uh, folded up, uh, or up, the second row up, it's about 28 cubic feet or 793 liters. And then behind the first row, when you fold those seats down, they're a 60-40 split. Uh, you get 54 cubic feet or 100, uh, sorry, 1,529 liters, according to the numbers, of storage space, which is a good amount of space. You know, you can take this tonneau cover off. Um, underneath here, there's not a ton of storage space. It's basically just for a repair kit, maybe some papers some tools or something like that. Anything thin, you know, that's no more, no more than a couple of inches uh, thick that you can carry down there. Um, and I'll uh, show you close-ups and then some other storage crannies, uh, storage nooks and crannies for the jack and things like that. But, you know, ideally it's not going to be a ton of storage space, but it's going to be adequate for a lot of people. You know, from ergonomic, it's a very comfortable vehicle. You do sit high, so you sit as high as an Escape or a RAV4 or so those similar vehicles, um, because I'm being able to look to look those drivers in the eyes when I'm driving around uh, at a level. So you do sit a little higher. Um, it doesn't feel top heavy because of the weight in the floor with that battery pack. It's got a nice planted feel to it. Um, even with the 20 inch wheels, it's got uh, good traction and very planted. Um, now, ergonomically, as I mentioned, you know, this has a, a funky new steering wheel that Kia has put together and, you know, it's, it's a nice grip and nice uh, features on it and buttons. I've found personally that I've had a bit of a hard time trying to get a comfortable position. The seats are very comfortable, they're adjustable, but what I mean by that is that I like to sit a little higher personally because I'm not that tall. I'm only about 5'6", five, 5'7". Five, so I like to sit a little higher so I can kind of see over the, the hood. Now, this has a very, of course, as I mentioned, that clamshell you know steep raked hood so I probably have this a little higher than I need to but that's just the way I am so when I do that then I have to bring the steering wheel down because uh, and, and you know to get comfortable when I do it kind of partially blocks the binnacle for me I've been able to set it a little bit higher than I would like to have it so I can see everything on the binnacle any warnings and some of the symbols uh, so for me ergonomically it's been a little bit challenging to find a a comfortable position that I like. Not to say the seats are not comfortable, they are. I had a viewer email me about the headrest saying, you know, they look, don't look comfortable, 
but they actually are because when you recline the seat, you know, that headrest is going back and I have no issues. It's not like the headrest is pushing pushing me over or anything like that. So that part is, is fine. The seats, the bolstering, everything is nice and comfortable. These have multiple power settings, power um, attributes to the seats. The console's nice, you know, you got an armrest here. This console does not move. It's a fixed one. It's not like the Ionic, which can move. So my, uh, my information on this part of the segment is that you just have to see if you can try it, sit in the vehicle and see if you can get a good comfortable position. Again, I've, I've been driving this for a week, so I'm not uncomfortable. I would like it a little bit better for me personally. Um, and each vehicle is a bit different on how they fit people. There's definitely enough width and uh, enough height to go for here. Now, if you're six foot, you're gonna have this a lot lower and you'll be able to lower the wheel. It lowers and telescopes in and things like that to get a position. Um, I just like to have things a little closer to me and, and you know, this is probably where I normally have it, but then now I'm blocking a, a good third of the binnacle with the top uh, part here. So um, it's just a little bit challenging for me on that, but uh, I'm not, maybe not normal. So for you, it might be fine. All right, now I always show you guys how I can get my uh, larger than life body in, into these vehicles. This has a pretty nice opening, of course. Now with this uh, roof that sl slants down, obviously you're gonna lose a bit of headroom in here. So most likely you're gonna have to duck a little bit to get in. That seems to be the trend with these sloping lines, but it does have a nice clearance. So it's, it's a little higher, as I said, than my, even my Model 3. So you can almost slide right in without having to step down too much, but it's a nice opening. Get in here. Oh, not too bad. Duck, the, duck my head a little bit. But yeah, so I've got over a fist of headroom. Again, I'm 5'6", five, 5'7". Five, um, lots of leg room. As you can see, I have the seat set for me. So I've got tons of leg room here. Nice width, definitely comfortable for four people, five in a pinch, you know, somebody can sit in the middle. The good thing is there is no um, transmission tunnel. Of course, it's a flat floor. So that fifth person in the middle won't have to worry about you know, uh, finding a comfortable position for their feet. But uh, I put my feet under the seat halfway, so there's lots of room there. It's a very comfortable seating environment, um, uh, nice. Uh, you could certainly do some longer trips in this. Again, if you're though six feet and more, you might be bonking your head a little bit on this back roof and obviously have to lift under, but. Uh... All right, just some quick video of the interior. There's lots of stuff going on, as you can see. It's got a good mix of buttons and soft touch controls. You got all kinds of, you got memory seats on this one, your door, standard door controls. You can fold in the mirrors from here as well. Um, again, this has two binnacles, your driver's binnacle, 12 inch uh, screens here, and then your uh, standard one for your main menus and all the good stuff that's there. Again, everything's very functional. As you can see, I mentioned about that, that wheel, you know, kind of getting a little bit in the way the way I have it here. Uh, this is about my eye line. So as you can see, I would have to have it down. So again, it's something just ergonomics that you'd have to figure out. Lots of steering wheel controls for the adaptive cruise and functions there, lane keeping, um, as well as changing some uh, up and down your speeds. And then you've got different modes you can set here, favorite buttons, your volume controls, and then your drive mode, which is, I've got it on eco, but you can do uh, normal mode and you can do sport mode. Uh, and sport mode's pretty quick. I've been leaving it on eco. Um, and as you can see, I bring that up. Uh, I just charged it last night, so it's showing a very high average because I've only gone three kilometers uh, on it so far. Um, but uh, it, I've been around the, I'll put some numbers at the end on all my mileage uh, coming up uh, as well on this. Uh, then you've got your soft touch controls here for your HVAC system, which are okay. Sometimes I do find if I'm turning the temperature, I kind of touch the auto climate because it can be very sensitive. Um, so, so I'm not a huge fan of soft touch. I'd rather have some buttons, but you know, owning a Model 3, everything's on the display, so I am used to it. You've got some soft touch buttons here as well for seat cooling, seat heater, steering wheel heater, and the like. Your on-off button, of course, your gear selector, and you'll see this similar style in the Ionic. Um, and in the Genesis, Genesis has that ball, the GV60, but the under underneath, it's the same kind of mechanisms. It's just a different um, uh, way of deploying that. You've got some nice cup holders here, and uh, this is a wireless charging pad, and then a decent size storage nook for putting junk in. Uh, I mentioned very comfortable seats here. You've got your top, you've got your power, your moonroof and your lights, uh, your SOS button. Now this does have a shade that comes across, so if you want to close the shade, which is really nice. Again, it's a little bit, it's a not a thin uh, fabric. It's a pretty good fabric. And then if you want to open it up, of course, you can. And then if you want to open the roof up as well, you just do that and off it goes. And you could stop it at any point in the process if you wanted to just have half or full. If you want to get the wind blown look, it does pop up there, as you can see, and then folds nicely back down. 
and closes the lid for you as well. So I'm going to leave that lid open because I like to have it open. Um, you know, standard vanity stuff, nothing really earth shattering here. You've got a light that you can turn on for the vanity mirror stuff. Um, good visibility. Again, this the, uh, uh, doesn't really block a lot of the visibility. The rear view mirror and such and the cameras that are up there. And then multi-function display. Lots of different elements here that you can look at. I'm not going to get into the menus. You know, EV settings are pretty common. Uh, you can say it's fairly responsive and uh, tells you all kinds of settings. You can uh, do destination, uh, sorry, uh, per Precondition charging and all the kinds of features the VTL V2L as well. You can say uh, don't let it get below You know, I don't want to use the VTL below a certain number I put it up to 80 because I was playing with it But normally you leave it like at 20 which means that you won't be able to take any juice out of the vehicle If the state of the, the battery charge is at 20% or lower at that point in charge So lots of neat things that you can play around and explore the menus on you can see it's fairly responsive it does support Apple uh, um, CarPlay and Android Auto as well. You can project your phone as well onto this um, and uh, get that mirroring, screen mirroring. It's got all kinds of different modes, the climate. It's nice. Again, uh, sometimes these are a little bit hard to get used to, um, but you know, again, after time, you will. Now, a couple small things that I've noticed. First of all is for your regenerative braking, you have your paddles. You have a plus and minus here, the steering wheel. It's set for three. I can go down to, um, to two and one. Let me just see here. Maybe I have to have the door closed. Okay, so we can, if we want to go down, maybe I have to have it in gear. Yeah, so we have to have in gear to go down. Now we can go to uh, 3210. Zero is a coast mode. And then your plus up here to increase it. And if you click click it to max, you get iPedal. And iPedal is just as it sounds. It's, it'll take you to a stop. Um, I characterize the iPedal as kind of in between the low and the standard regen in the Model 3, it, or or uh, which the standard is fairly high regen in my opinion, the low is very soft. It, this is in the middle. It actually has a very nice capability to feather the accelerator to get your nice smooth stops and nice smooth accelerations out of it. So the iPedal is very good. Now, one thing though, every time you restart the car, if you want it in iPedal, you have to engage it again. Otherwise, it defaults to, I think at this point, level three regen. It goes to that all the time. So one thing is they don't save that particular setting, which is a bit annoying because sometimes you forget to, to engage iPedal. So I wish that they would kind of remember that setting, but for some reason they don't. Um, that's kind of really the main uh uh, thing that I've noticed about in driving this. Um, you'll see in the driving videos I talk about the uh, cruise control and stuff and some of the issues I had during the weather. So I'll let you watch that. But overall, a very nice, comfortable interior. So from the back seat, again, you have some controls on the door, some cup holders. This has the Meridian sound system, which is pretty nice. I like having the vents in the uh, B pillars here. That's pretty cool. So you can get uh, good elements. Um, again, nothing in the middle console. If you're looking for USB ports for the rear passengers, they're here in the seats, as you can see there. One there, one there. These are USB-C ports, but a nice interior. I've got my sign here, because uh, I'm out and about recording. Uh, it's okay, it's all plastic, hard plastic backs here with that aircraft style map holder so it's a comfortable environment and then you've got a couple of led lights that you can turn on for reading at night as well So as it gets close to wrapping this up, before I show you some of the driving videos, just talk about some of the driver safety assist systems or what they call the um, advanced driver assistant systems or ADAS. You'll hear that term used by a lot of people now, a lot of manufacturers. This has a full complement, you know, your standard, um, you know, uh, uh, front uh, collision avoidance. Uh, this has blind spot avoidance assist, which actually works really well because the other day I was backing out of a shopping uh, parking lot and there was a car coming and he was probably five lengths away and it picked it up and started beeping and it gives you a direction arrow telling you what what side it's coming from and it goes red and beep so it was very very good i mean i wasn't going fast or anything so i have to say that a lot of the, the newer uh, uh, backup blind spot monitoring systems are really good and that's one thing tesla man I, you know elon i know you're not watching this but you gotta send an update and, and do something about the Model 3 when you're backing up because it's not a very good warning system when you're backing up. It's very late if it even gives you something. But anyway, that's my little pet peeve there. But your forward collision avoidance, your pedestrian, uh, 
you know, a, a safety a lane change as well. This has some additional options like a, a lane change assist and a parking assist. Um, I'll show you a little video on, on a summons feature that this model has as well. So you can see that coming up. Uh, but you full uh, suite of safety uh, monitoring systems that are work really well. All right, so one thing the uh, EV6s have on the South Korean vehicles, also Ionic and Genesis, uh, is the uh, summons feature. And you know you have it in some of the upscale trims because your key fob comes with these three buttons on the side. And what you do is once it's in park, you press the lock button, press and hold the hold button. Now you have to be fairly close, but there you see the signal has come on. So that means it's activated. And then I press the reverse P button and Hold it, and as long as you're holding it, it will reverse out for you. So I'm gonna get out of the way here so that I don't interrupt it and let it do its thing. So as you can see, I have a bit of a bump there between my driveway and the garage because our driveway continues to sink. So it dips down, so it backs out. It won't back in because the driveway actually catches it and it doesn't wanna to give too much power. And uh, that's it. So now I've stopped it and um, it's ready to board, ready to get in. So pretty cool feature. All right, so I'll give you my quick driving thoughts of the Kia EV6 here as I take my uh, favorite road up the Bell Fountain in the town of Caledon. Nice winding road. Um, you know, it's been a great vehicle for the few days that I've had it. Um, very quiet, as you can hear, lots of soundproofing, and we're seeing that pretty well in most of the OEM vehicles now, the newer EVs coming out. They're very well insulated from the road noise. This has big 20 inch tires, so it still may, remains relatively very quiet. Um, a nice comfortable ride, as I mentioned, it handles the bumps quite well. There's nothing that jars and gets unsettling for this. It has that nice stance. Uh, again, I have to have my seat high for the visibility, but I do have good visibility all around, even in the rear, which does look a little small, but actually it's quite fine for visibility. The nice big side bears. Um, so visibility all around that you can see things. Very comfortable ride, nice responsive steering as you're gonna find, and that good planted feel again. Um, the range has been uh, pretty well bang on, or very close to the estimates that have given. And that's one thing I found with the Kia and Hyundai products is that um, their, their computation for their range um, and uh, battery state of charge and those settings have been very, very good. So um, uh, something that you can rely on uh, to giving you accurate uh, information. Of course, it's dependent on the driving and speed and weather and terrain, but uh, they're all pretty good. But this handles quite nice, a very comfortable vehicle. Um, not really much to complain about um, other than that ergonomics that I mentioned for me personally, but a very capable, well-built, solid uh, vehicle. Again, no squeaks or rattles, anything like that. Um, lovely vehicle to take on these winding country roads. It's certainly not a Porsche or uh, an Audi e-tron or anything like that, uh, but it does handle quite well, has more than enough power to get you up and going. And uh, I actually have to watch the power on this road because it's a very passive road to take they want people to keep their speeds down of course so uh, so really there's nothing negative to say about the driving of this vehicle it's quite competent um, I've got some video footage coming up now uh, when I took it out in the snow a few days ago um, in my experience there this is the all-wheel drive version so I had no problems managing the snow but you'll see that um, but my overall take on this vehicle it's a lovely vehicle to drive I really like um, the quietness and the the power more than enough power uh, the eye pedal is a really good um, instance of eye pedal as i mentioned there it's got a very nice feel to it it's easy to manipulate to get a nice smooth uh, start and to uh, get a nice smooth break uh, when you need to stop and uh, it does hold quite well now there is an auto hold button so that if you're running in non eye pedal mode in one of the other regen modes when you stop using the brake pedal, then it will continue to keep you stopped until you hit the accelerator by engaging the auto hold. But uh, I found the eye pedal to be a really pleasant experience and I've been driving around with that all week. So um, again, overall, I, I, 
there, I don't really have anything negative to add about this vehicle. I'm going to sound like a broken record. Um, it's just a very comfortable, capable vehicle. I've had some passengers in here. They've been comfortable. There's enough room for that. Uh, did, did some grocery shopping earlier in the week. Enough room for a bunch of bags of stuff. Um, so, you know, very capable all around vehicle. Fits into my garage, uh, as you can see by the pictures. Um, easy to charge. Uh, easy to set up all those parameters so uh, very competent car and you know something that i would expect from kia and from hyundai and from genesis on their implementation of evs and with this new platform uh, again my hats off to them they've done a great job it's an uh, outstanding vehicle and uh, certainly something that you folks who are interested in looking at uh, that if you like the style and uh, what this offers should look at okay so i'm just uh in the EV6 here and I've got the nav going and uh, I've got it set for a virtual reality so what it does hopefully you can see that heads up display here it, it projects the navigation route onto here and then as you get closer to your turns it puts arrows um, and beeps at you when you're coming up to a turn um, it's and of course you got the voice guidance as well that helps you with all this so I'm just uh, following it here Round and recalculating the route. road for about one kilometer yeah it's telling me to go a, a route that I don't need to go because I know where I'm going here but anyway just uh, you know want to give you that it's nothing really crazy I know that there's been talk about this augmented reality but it's just more uh, symbols that are projected there you see the blind spot warning uh, pops up when that uh, pickup truck went by me so that's a nice feature to have uh, is that um, I know you can lower the HUD. I'll probably lower it a bit um, because it's kind of right. It should be in the middle, but I find it a bit distracting. Uh, but anyway, just wanted to quick sh quickly show you what the HUD looks like. It's a nice feature. One thing that's nice, of course, that the Hyundai and Kia share, and I think Genesis as well, is the uh, turn signal blind spot indicator camera that comes on. Uh, when you signal left or right, it beeps at you too if you're next to a car. Uh, it's a nice feature that uh, helps to uh, really see that. And uh, of course I showed it when I did the initial Ionic 5. Quick look, it actually works really well in the uh, rain as well. All right, so just uh, part of my weekly driving here. We have a nice snowstorm happening today in Southern Ontario, only a couple centimeters, but uh, I'm having to go to another town and uh, I'm taking all country roads as opposed to the major highway. So getting a good sense of the, the vehicle's ability to handle, of course, snow covered roads, a little bit of slick. Uh, we have some wet snow coming down, um, so some mixed precipitation and different road conditions. I've been uh, on some winding roads already and so far so good. Uh, this is the all wheel drive version. So with traction control and all the safety features, it seems to be working fine. I haven't had any issues. This is a brand new vehicle, so the tires are brand new. They are running winter tires on this vehicle still. Um, so, so far so good. It's a nice quiet ride and it's handling the bumps quite well and the uh, little bit slippery conditions. So just to gain a good test of the vehicle because, um, you know, taking test drives in beautiful weather, uh, most vehicles are going to perform quite well. So it's uh, good to take them when the weather is not so nice. And that way you get a good sense of really how the car can perform. So one thing a little bit of snow does, and I would have thought that this hasn't been that much snow, really, maybe a centimeter, uh, if that. Um, but one of the things, I guess, um, that collects on the vehicle, the front, is the front radar. And when, if I try to act, activate the cruise control, obviously it's not letting me do that because it came up with a warning message that the radar is blocked. Um, and even if, uh, usually you could hold the, the cruise button to get just regular cruise control, but that doesn't seem to be coming on either. Because if I let off, it doesn't do anything. So uh, that's one thing I would have thought that um, Kia would have a heater, possibly heater element around the front facing radar so that you could um, continue with at least a cruise control if function. Um, Cause it won't, I'll have to check the menu to see if I can get into regular cruise control but for the adaptive cruise control, it obviously isn't working because it's saying uh, conditions are not met because of it being blocked, it came up with a message earlier. So just something to take note of. All right, so I have an opportunity to try out the adaptive cruise control and lane keeping. Um, as you can see, it's activated. You got the green steering wheel. I've got my cruise set to 84. Um, and the conditions are wet, not that slippery, just wet. It looks a little worse than it is um, going through these country roads. And uh, the lane keeping actually works really, really well. 
Um, it's navigating the turns, it's staying within the lanes, as you can see here. It's not uh, bobbing and weaving back and forth or ping-ponging, as we say. It's following the line of the, uh, of the bends in the road nicely, not getting too close to this center line or too close to the right line. So it is centering quite well within the uh, lane. So um, now we've got the radar blocked because we've got some snow on it. It's pretty sensitive, this radar. As I said earlier, it, um, it stopped working. So now my cruise control is not going to work. Um, the Kia EV6 uh, is one of the models as long with the Ionic 5 and the Genesis GV60 that have rear hatches that don't have wiper blades, uh, rear wipers. And I pointed that out in the Ionic 5 first look when I was down in San Diego. And, you know, my concern would be how much of an issue would that be in this kind of weather when you get these bad weather conditions. So as you can see here by looking in the rear view mirror, if I can get a, an angled shot here, uh, let me just see how I could get that. Hopefully you can see that okay. Um, that I'm able to see outside. I've got the rear defogger on constantly and it is melting the snow that's there and I am able to see. Hopefully you got enough of that to be able to visualize it. So it's not bad. I, I would prefer to have a wiper. Uh, to be honest with you, the, the spoiler that's there is supposed to blow, you know, create some wind stream to, to blow the moisture down. But, you know, I've, I've, I mean, can't go too fast in this weather, but I have been able to get up to about 80 kilometers an hour at one point, 80, 85. And um, it's, I don't see anything blowing off there. So, and I was on the highway earlier today where it was a little less precip and I didn't notice anything either. So I think that's something that manufacturers have to take into consideration here is if they're not going to put wiper blades, they've got to be real sure about the maintaining the visibility, especially in these days where we have adverse weather and, you know, so my theme is technology and weather today, I guess. Um, another thing that's going on is obviously with this wet, thick snow that's uh, piling up and you know on the car and the vehicle sliding down, as you can see, it's obviously covering sensors and, um, uh, and cameras and things like that. And one thing that's happening is every time I stop now, um, the, it's going off to show me that the cameras are clogged and then it'll, it starts beeping here and there. And sometimes it just, it shows which sensor is blocked on a map and we'll just continue to beep. <laughs> I've had to actually turn, you know, turn the camera off, which is pretty strange. Um, so I get it if a sensor is blocked, but I don't think there's any reason to go. So there we go. It just will start doing that. And um, as you can see, that can get kind of annoying <laughs> every time. Uh, you stop or uh, and, or start moving slowly, I guess, because the camera, the sensors are detecting that they're covered. Uh, again, just another, you know, fine tuning mechanism, I guess. You know, I'm picking a really good day to put this vehicle through its paces. Obviously, the, the first full day that I've had this vehicle and we have a really nice weather event here that is not common, but not uncommon for this part of Canada and for a lot of countries in the world. So, Again, if you're in a country that gets snow and gets this kind of weather, just something to think about. Again, these are not showstoppers in, in looking at this vehicle, but they're things that I think that the OEMs need to take into consideration if they're going to program these type of warnings and systems into the vehicles and put the technology that they've got to think about adverse weather conditions and what some of those impacts are. So anyway...
Well, I hope you enjoyed all that information uh, about the EV6. If we get into pricing now, this is Canadian pricing that I have, of course. I mentioned all those different uh, available options from the powertrain. So if you get your standard range rear wheel drive single motor option, comes in at just under 45,000 Canadian, which is great because it qualifies for the $5,000 federal rebate here in Canada. Plus you can stack provincial incentives that are available as well. If you want a long range version of that single motor, it'll cost you 52,995 as a base MSRP, plus you add your other stuff. If you want the long range all wheel drive, which is the maximum range, almost 500 kilometer variant, that'll cost you just under 55,000. So again, all these three trims qualify for that $5,000 federal incentive. Then if you want the long range all wheel drive, they're with those two GT line packages and you can go online to see all the specs and options that are available in those packages. You'll pay 57,995 for the GT line one and 61,995 for the GT line two, which is what this vehicle has equipped on it, the GT line two package. Uh, if you want the GT top of the line, powerful beast model, as uh, my friend had just called this vehicle, you'll pay $69,995. Uh, for a base MSRP plus your taxes. Now, I believe all the models except the GT all-wheel drive will still qualify for the $5,000 federal rebate because the GT Line 1 and GT Line 2 are option packages that are added on after the base MSRP and they would still qualify, but you have to make sure you talk to the dealer that you're going to to order these things and make sure you get them to write it up the correct way because some of them may not. It's still a learning curve for some of these folks. So you wanna make sure you get your 5K. So very well in line pricing with everything else that is in this model class. All right, in closing, so uh, what's my summary thoughts on this? this? is a very capable vehicle, an excellent vehicle. Kia's build quality, again, with all the HMC products are quite high. No squeaks, rattles, anything like that. This is a brand new vehicle, got about 1,500 kilometers on it, so 800 miles, 900 miles, something like that. Uh, so very, very brand new. Uh, rides very nice. This has a much better ride than my Model 3. Uh, it wouldn't be as grippy on the track as my Model 3, but from a shock absorbing and just a comfort level, it's a much nicer ride. So they've done some great things on the suspension setup. Lots of power for this vehicle, a good amount of interior room for most use cases, a decent cargo space. So do I recommend this vehicle? Hey, absolutely. I'm a big fan of the Kia and Hyundai and Genesis products, of course, the quality is there. And this is a great uh, next step in the evolution of the Kia electrification front for their use of their global platform. It's a nice, nice machine. And I truly recommend it. If it's something you like the styling, it can fit into your budget. Definitely a all electric vehicle to consider. All right, and that's it for this edition of the EV Revolution Show. Thanks very much for tuning in. Hopefully you enjoyed this episode. If you're watching on YouTube, I thank you very much. If you're not subscribing, please click that subscribe button. You can also click that bell and turn on your notifications so you'll know when I push new shows up to the YouTube cloud. Uh, again, thanks for watching. And if you haven't subscribed, please do. If you are a Patreon supporter, you know I'm always very humbled by my Patreon supporters. Thank you very much for that. If you want more information, you can check the link below and check out what that's all about. If you feel like you want to support me, that would be fantastic. Again, everybody continue to stay safe and stay healthy as we get through these things and keep your eyes on the EV marketplace because this is a busy, busy year. But again, thank you very much for tuning in. I very much appreciate it. Everybody stay safe. And until the next show, I'll see you when I see you. Take care and bye-bye.